night, a deadly collision and the battle against time. The urgent investigation now underway after an airline's jet caught fire after colliding with a Coast Guard plane. Those killed and injured in Tokyo as the country deals with a rising death toll after a massive earthquake hit the race to save those trapped. And when you realized that Josh, he didn't survive, how did you explain that to your children? I don't honestly remember all of the details. My two older children saw me crying and they knew. A town torn apart and a community shattered by a senseless shooting. We take you to Lewiston, Maine and meet with the men, women and children still reeling from what could be the deadliest day for the deaf community in the United States history and the strength now being harnessed as they try to move forward. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more including the deadly car blast in Rochester that may have been intentional. Plus the rise in respiratory illnesses impacting children across the country as they go back to school following the holidays and what parents can do to prepare. And she's facing death threats and now an expulsion from her job after ruling Donald Trump ineligible to be on the main primary ballot. Maine's Secretary of State joins us to discuss that and more. But we do begin in Japan, where that country is now reeling from the aftermath of twin tragedies, a 7.6 magnitude earthquake and a wild passenger plane crash. The crash, though, is being called a miracle tonight after all 379 passengers and crew made it safely off of the plane after their Japan Airlines flight slammed into a Coast Guard aircraft. Take a look at the moment the plane came in and erupted into a fireball. The shocking scene played out at Tokyo's Haneda International Airport, one of the busiest in the world. Passengers raced down the emergency slide. Every one of them got away before the plane was completely engulfed in flames. That plane is one of the largest and most modern aircraft made, and the design is being credited tonight with saving lives. But sadly, at least five people on board the Coast Guard plane did pass away. That plane was full of supplies bound for the part of Western Japan, devastated by an earthquake roughly 24 hours earlier. The death toll from the quake is at least 55 people as aftershocks continue to rattle the region. Tonight, investigators are trying to figure out why the Coast Guard plane was on the same runway. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, leads us off tonight from Tokyo. Tonight, the urgent investigation into how this Japan Airlines flight landing at one of the busiest airports in the world collided with a Japanese Coast Guard plane readying for takeoff. Video showing the moment of impact, Flight 516 loaded with 379 passengers and crew engulfed in flames blazing down the runway. The plane sliding to a stop on its nose and belly. Inside, smoke fills the cabin, emergency slides deployed, and dozens of firefighters dousing the wreckage with fire retardant. Landing. Landing. Landing after but, fire. And then, but they went on the slides. Yeah. The emergency uh, exit. No, no, yes, yes, yes. We spoke to Yamake, who was on that flight, and says this video was shot from his seat, fire shooting from the engine. Then what he saw on the outside. The plane on its belly, foam raining down as fire incinerated the wing. Miraculously, everyone on board was evacuated within seconds. Authorities saying 17 people suffered injuries. Tonight, the runway is closed and only the charred hull remains. Experts crediting the carbon fiber fuselage and passengers heeding the commands of cabin crew with all those lives saved. Almost always these incursions and these near misses are the result of human error. Whether it was human error in the control tower, on the ground, in one of the cockpits, that's something that the Japanese will need to determine. French crash investigators joined by five investigators from Airbus will travel to Japan. This is what they'll be focusing on. Japan and five and six continue with sleep right. Communication with air traffic control. Japanese authorities saying five members of that Coast Guard plane sitting on the runway were killed. This was part of the twin tragedies that struck Japan within 24 hours. That Coast Guard flight headed to western Japan to deliver aid after a massive 7.6 earthquake shook the country hours into the new year. The quake sparking fires and liquefying the ground, triggering mudslides. The death toll there rising. At least 55 people have died as rescuers raced to find trapped residents under collapsed buildings. And more tremors today as new footage shows the widespread destruction, roads split in two, homes buried under the mud. 
This could have been one of the deadliest aviation disasters in history. Matt Gutman joins us now from the Haneda Airport in Tokyo. And Matt, we can see all those stranded passengers behind you. Uh, what are those passengers who made it off of that plane unscathed telling you tonight? Incredibly, they're saying that it was calm, that all the passengers on the plane heeded the advice of the crew to stay calm, to exit in an orderly fashion, and above all, to leave their personal effects behind. And as you mentioned, this could have been far deadlier. One of the things that is becoming clear in the probe so far is that had that uh, Coast Guard cargo plane nosed even a few feet farther onto the runway as flight 516 came in, it might have not hit the wing or the engine of the plane as it did, but the fuselage, and that could have caused a catastrophic explosion that could have killed perhaps all of the people on board that flight, Lindsay. And just remarkable to hear them say there was so much calm there. Uh, Matt Gutman for us in Tokyo tonight. Thanks so much, Matt. Back here in the U.S., investigators in Rochester, New York, say they believe a deadly car crash just after midnight on New Year's Day appeared to be intentional but not terrorism. A large SUV collided with an Uber pulling out of a parking lot as a concert was getting out. Both vehicles struck pedestrians crossing the street. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky has the details. Tonight, police here in Rochester believe this fiery crash less than an hour into 2024 was no accident. They identified this man, 35-year-old Michael Avery, as the driver of a large SUV filled with gas cans that barreled into a crowd of people leaving a concert, and they said he did it on purpose. Avery sped up, crossed into the oncoming lane of traffic, and appears to have intentionally been driving towards the pedestrian crossing. Nine pedestrians were hurt, but many more could have been had the SUV not collided with a smaller rideshare vehicle pulling out of the parking lot, killing two passengers. Identified tonight as 29-year-old Joshua Orr and 28-year-old Justina Hughes. You believe he sped up or sped toward the he crosswalk did. and the pedestrians? Yes, you can clearly see that. It was intentional. And it was days in the making. Police said Avery came to Rochester from Syracuse, checking into a hotel December 27th. Police have now searched his room. Two days later, he left his car at the airport and rented the large SUV. The day after that, he went around buying gas cans and filling them up. At least a dozen were found in and around the charred wreckage. The smell of gasoline was just so intense. I, I couldn't believe how strong it was. So far, authorities have found no evidence of any ties to foreign or domestic terrorism and no social or political bias. The suspect died of his injuries. Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, do officials have any idea if the suspect had a connection to the venue? That's one of the questions the mayor was asking. Why Rochester? Why this theater? Why gas cans? And so far, Lindsay, the police say that he has no known ties uh, to Rochester, to this theater, or any of the concert goers. His family told police they believe that Avery was suffering some kind of an undiagnosed mental health condition. Lindsay. All right. Aaron Katursky for us. Thanks so much, Aaron. Authorities are now investigating an alarming break in at the Colorado Supreme Court in Denver. Investigators say a suspect shot his way into the building overnight. No justices were there at the time, but they've been on edge and under threat after a ruling last month barred former President Trump from the state's primary ballot. ABC's Mo Lange is in Denver. Tonight, an armed man breaking into the Colorado Supreme Court building in Denver, where justices are already on high alert after ruling Donald Trump off the state's primary ballot two weeks ago. Police saying 44-year-old Brandon Olson was first involved in a car crash right outside the court building just after 1 a.m. There was a car accident. One of the vehicles involved already pulled a gun out. Police adding that Olson pointed that gun at the other driver, then broke into the building by shooting out a window. Authorities saying he then held an unarmed guard at gunpoint, took his keys, and made his way to the seventh floor, where he fired from the building. Officials say no one was struck. A tense standoff dragging on for two hours until about 3 a.m., Olson calling 911 and surrendering. Colorado court justices receiving threats after ruling President Trump ineligible for the state's primary, citing the Constitution's 14th Amendment in saying his actions on January 6th amounted to insurrection. But officials today say they've confirmed with a high probability this incident is not associated to the recent threats. Mola Lange joins us now from Denver. Mola, what else do we know about the investigation and the charges? Well, Lindsay, Denver police still investigating the suspect's motive, currently holding him on suspicion of uh, burglary and arson, uh, accusing him of starting a small fire inside one of the building's stairwells. But again, a motive is still being investigated here, Lindsay. 
Mola Lange for us reporting from Denver. Thanks so much, Mola. And it's that 14th Amendment case against the former president that's the center of the political world's attention with all eyes on the Trump team and their expected appeal of that case all the way to the Supreme Court. The ripple effects of the case could be huge and impact almost every presidential campaign going forward. Can a former president be ousted from the ballot? And what about the pending case in Maine? Our Rachel Scott has that as we mark just 13 days until the Iowa caucuses. Tonight, former President Donald Trump is fighting to get on every primary ballot, appealing the decision by Maine Secretary of State as biased, saying she had no legal authority to bar him from running. In two unprecedented decisions, Maine and Colorado had taken the former president off the ballot, citing the 14th Amendment, which blocks anyone who swore an oath to the Constitution and engaged in an insurrection or rebellion from holding office. But Trump's lawyers tonight arguing the insurrection clause bars people from holding specified offices, not from running for them or being elected to them, insisting the secretary wrongfully denied President Trump a place on the Republican primary ballot. With just 13 days until the first contest, Trump still holds a commanding lead in Iowa, more than 30 points ahead of his rivals. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is going all in on Iowa, visiting all 99 counties. Are you ready to work hard over these next two weeks so that we win the Iowa caucus? But he's losing ground to Nikki Haley, who is gaining momentum. Only Trump, Haley and DeSantis have qualified for the next debate. And tonight, Haley challenging Trump to show up with her and DeSantis, saying as the debate stage continues to shrink, it's getting harder for Donald Trump to hide. Many of those GOP presidential candidates pushing for Trump to be present on the next debate stage. Rachel Scott joins us now. And Rachel, back to the decisions to yank former President Trump from the ballot in Colorado as well as Maine. It would seem like this is headed all the way to the Supreme Court. It certainly does look that way. We are told that the former president still plans to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court on that Colorado decision. So it's looking more and more likely that the justices will have to weigh in on the central question of whether the former president, the Republican frontrunner, can appear on these primary ballots, Lindsay. Rachel Scott reporting from Des Moines, Iowa for us tonight. Thanks so much, Rachel. And joining us now with more is Maine Secretary of State Shenna Bellows. Thank you so much for your time and joining us tonight. Uh, you've received escalating threats against you, including a swatting call after your address was leaked. Walk us through what the past few days have been like since you made your decision. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a really difficult weekend. I anticipated uh, criticism, strong language directed toward me, but targeting my family and the people who work for me and the people around me with threatening and abusive communications is unacceptable. Swatting my home is unacceptable. And law enforcement has responded perfectly. I was away for the holiday weekend with my husband, so nothing happened. But just because it was a fake call doesn't make it any less dangerous, especially given what we've seen across the country with incidents where law enforcement and the family that was targeted were were less prepared. Why did you ultimately come to the conclusion that the former president's behavior warranted taking this step? So Maine has a very unique procedure under Maine law. Once a candidate is qualified for the ballot, which I did for Mr. Trump, any registered Maine voter can bring a challenge to that qualification. And in fact, five registered Maine voters, including two former Republican state senators, brought a challenge to Mr. Trump's qualifications. I was then obligated under Maine election law to hold an administrative hearing, hear evidence from both sides who were represented by attorneys, and then issue a decision. I did not have the option to decline. So I reviewed the weight of the evidence in the hearing and made the determination that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment does apply to the president and that the events of January 6 were not only tragic, uh, but qualified as an insurrection and happened at the behest of and with the knowledge and support of the outgoing president. The main GOP primary, as you well know, is March 5th. In your decision, you punted physically removing Trump from the ballot until an appeals court rules on the legality. When does your office need absolute clarity on this as you also have an election to run? I very intentionally suspended the effect of my decision pending a ruling by the courts, because that is the process, Superior Court, the Maine Supreme Court, and then the U.S. Supreme Court. 
January 20th is the deadline for military and overseas voters to receive their ballots. Under main law, the Superior Court has until January 17th to make a ruling. I will fulfill whatever I am directed to do by the courts. Do you anticipate this case ultimately ending up before the Supreme Court? I certainly think it could. That's part of the process and certainly would welcome uh, the Supreme Court weighing in. California had a deadline of last week to remove Trump from the ballot and declined to do so. California Governor Gavin Newsom said while Trump is a threat to our liberties, quote, we defeat candidates at the polls. Everything else is a political distraction. Similarly, presidential candidate Chris Christie has said Maine's decision will make Trump a martyr. Your response? So Mr. Chris Christie was also disqualified for the Maine ballot under Maine election laws because he failed to gather sufficient signatures. He sued in Superior Court. The Superior Court upheld my decision. So Maine law is unique. It's different than other states, including California. But regardless, the political or personal or, or any other considerations other than the Constitution and the rule of law are not appropriate. My job was to follow the Constitution, to which I swore an oath, and to follow the law. And that is the way our process works in this democratic republic. Yeah, but what do you say to critics who say, look, the voters should ultimately be given the opportunity to vote and make those decisions at the polls? The United States Constitution sets the qualifications for presidential candidates. I cannot place an 18-year-old on the ballot or a non-citizen, or if Barack Obama or George W. Bush wanted to run for president a third time and could get sufficient signatures, I would be prohibited under Maine law from placing them on the ballot. The qualifications for president under the United States Constitution are not a menu. They're not optional. My job is to follow the Constitution and the law. Maine Secretary of State Shenna Bellows, we thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Robert Menendez is facing additional allegations of wrongdoing contained in a superseding indictment returned today in New York. The superseding indictment accuses Menendez, who has pleaded not guilty to all prior counts of making positive comments about Qatar in exchange for items of value, including luxury wristwatches. According to the new indictment, the luxury wristwatches Menendez was allegedly offered were valued between ten to $24,000. The senator has said he will not step down from office and has strongly denounced the charges. Claudine Gay, Harvard's first black president, resigned today just four weeks after testifying at a congressional hearing on anti-Semitism. Her tenure is now the shortest in the history of the institution. ABC's senior White House correspondent Selena Wang has that report. Tonight, Harvard's embattled president Claudine Gay resigning, facing accusations of plagiarism and weeks of criticism for her congressional testimony on anti-Semitism and hate on campus. In a statement, Gay saying she resigned, quote, so that our community can navigate this moment of extraordinary challenge with a focus on the institution rather than any individual. Gay was one of the three top university presidents who came under fire over their statements to members of Congress who said those leaders were not doing enough to combat anti-Semitism. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. What's the context? Targeted as, at an individual. It's targeted at Jewish students, Jewish individuals. Do you understand your testimony is dehumanizing them? Afterwards, Gay apologized for what she called poor wording in her testimony. Gay under pressure to step down from House members, donors, and prominent alumni. And more recently, she faced allegations of plagiarism for material contained in her academic writings. Harvard had previously ordered an investigation that revealed, quote, a few instances of inadequate citation, but the university finding no violation of its standards for research misconduct. Selena Wang joins us now. And Selena, what kind of reaction is coming in now from some of Gay's colleagues with regard to her resignation? Well, look, some of the professors at Harvard, they are angry about how all of this went down. They're saying that Harvard is caving to Republican political pressure. And Claudine Gay, she was the university's first black president. She only held the position for six months. And Lindsay, that is the shortest tenure in the university's history. Selena Wang for us. Thanks so much, Selena. 
Now to Beirut, where an explosion has killed six people, including the second highest ranking leader of Hamas in Lebanon's capital. Two U.S. officials say Israel was responsible for the strike. The attack risks spreading the war and bringing the well-armed Hezbollah militia into the fight. ABC's Marcus Moore is in Israel for us tonight. Tonight, a massive explosion rocking the Lebanese capital, Beirut, killing a top Hamas official. Video circulating online showing the fiery scene of the blast in the Beirut suburb of Dahia, a Hezbollah stronghold. Salak al-Aruri, the second in command of Hamas and a senior leader in the West Bank, among at least six people killed, according to Lebanese authorities. <laughs> Lebanon's state-run news agency says Israel carried out the attack, which, if confirmed, would mark a major escalation and would be Israel's first attack on Beirut since 2006. Israel tonight declining to comment. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had threatened to kill Aruri before the Israel-Hamas war erupted on October 7th. Today's blast in Beirut follows weeks of cross-border attacks in southern Lebanon and northern Israel between Hezbollah fighters and IDF soldiers. And Marcus Moore joins us now from Tel Aviv. Marcus, are there fears of retaliation at this point? Uh, Lindsay, there are. Everyone here in the region is bracing for retaliation from uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, both groups saying that they will respond to uh, tonight's attack. And it adds to the concerns that have, been, that have existed since October 7th that this war could escalate into a much wider conflict. Lindsay. Yeah, that has been an ongoing concern. Marcus Moore for us from Tel Aviv. Thanks so much, Marcus. Russia launched an attack on Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities earlier today, continuing its escalated large-scale attacks on residential areas. The attacks, which also hit Kharkiv, lasted about four hours, with Russia launching about a dozen ballistic missiles and about 35 Iranian-made drones. According to President Zelensky, at least five people were killed and 101 injured. Mounting pressure now on some of America's cities continuing as migrants continue to arrive and no resolve appears to be in sight. Last month alone, CBP agents encountered more than 302,000 migrants, an all-time high. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has more tonight as fears that the migrant crisis could be entering a new phase, the U.S. suburbs. Tonight, the influx of migrants to major cities far from the border is spreading to their suburbs after New York's mayor, Eric Adams, issued an order requiring buses carrying migrants from border cities to New York to give the city a minimum of 32 hours notice. Hundreds of migrants were instead bused to commuter train stations in New Jersey, where they rode trains into New York, effectively circumventing the order. A similar situation in the suburbs of Chicago. Some 350 migrants flown to Rockford Airport over the weekend, then bussed in. Tonight, Mayor Adams is blaming Texas Governor Greg Abbott and asking more cities to issue executive orders. It's not about just New York. No city should be going through this, and it's not sustainable. Sources tell ABC News there were 302,000 migrant encounters in December alone. The preliminary numbers far surpassing the previous record of nearly 270,000 in September. Oh. Abbott and other border governors have said until the situation is brought under control and properly addressed, they will continue to send migrants to these so-called sanctuary cities. Stephanie Ramos joins us now. Stephanie, have lawmakers been in talks with federal officials or even Congress? They have, Lindsay. Lawmakers on both sides actually agree they need federal help and a solution from Congress to deal with this situation. Today, actually, senators met with the Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, and negotiators are expected to keep meeting this week to try and reach a deal on the border. Lindsay. So needed. Stephanie Ramos, our thanks to you. Still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. An important recall for parents. The infant formula pulled from the shelves over potential bacteria contamination. But next, a mass shooting in Lewiston, Maine, claimed 18 lives and shook the surrounding area. And for the deaf community there, strained communication made the pain of this tragedy even worse. Tonight, our Kira Phillips talks to the families of those lost as they find ways to connect to their loved ones and move forward in grief while healing. How do they feel? dad now oh they still feel very connected with their father it may seem odd for others but we i have a spiritual belief you know i have a light in the basement that still flickers and one day i went down there and it 
adjusted just at the right time. And so I, you know, I talked to Josh and I said, you're watching us. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live, streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes fall up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel, from the front lines. In Downtown Ramallah in Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back, everyone. It was a mass shooting in a state known for very little violent crime. But that all changed on October 25th when a gunman walked into two public places in Lewiston, Maine and opened fire. The result, 18 dead and a community thrown into grief, confusion and pain. It was the worst mass shooting event of the last year and is believed to be the deadliest day for the deaf community in U.S. history. Among the dead, four deaf friends playing cornhole, a sacred pastime for the deaf community in the area. Our Kira Phillips traveled to Lewiston to meet people who knew and loved those who lost their lives and are now finding comfort in each other. And we want to note the voices of American Sign Language interpreters are used in this piece. <laughs> Josh prioritized family. He was a family man. He did everything with us. On weekends, we would go out and do all kinds of different things as a family. But he also cared about the deaf community and helping people. He was the director for an interpreting agency, and so he was always helping to make sure that people could have access to their communication needs. How did you meet? So Josh and I met many years ago, I think it was 1991 in preschool at the Governor Baxter School for the Deaf. And we were in the same class. Many years later, once we were in high school, one of our mutual friends reconnected us. And we've been together ever since. We dated and married. We've had four children together. So we'd say the rest is history, as they say. Dad, who's that? Uh, Who is that? <gasps> Dad? We're learning details about what officials are calling a mass casualty event playing out in Lewiston, Maine. These small New England communities in and around Lewiston, Maine, north of Portland, ripped in fear. 18 people are now deceased. I didn't find out until the next day around noon when the police came to my door and told me the tragic news. 
He was with a group of deaf people on Wednesday night to enjoy a game of cornhole at Schmengi's bar. I had limited information because the news that was being shared was not clear. Maine State Police have issued a shelter-in-place order. We were calling hospitals, and the hospitals would not allow interpreters. When you realized that Josh, he didn't survive, how did you explain that to your children? I don't honestly remember all of the details. My two older children saw me crying, and they knew I didn't have to put it into words. I just said, yes, it happened. And they, of course, said, no, no, and they burst into tears. I can hear my daughter's screams from that day still in my memory. You know, it still feels like a nightmare. It doesn't feel real. How are you doing, Kathy? It feels like yesterday. It's like one day at a time. When people ask me every day how I'm doing, I say I'm okay. I'm okay today, and I'll see what tomorrow brings. What's it been like losing your partner in the business, doing this on your own? I never imagined it, losing somebody like that. He was my right hand. He had a big heart, and he was going to help whoever could help, and he knew I needed him. And now I'm trying to figure out how to do it without him. It's when everything happened, um, I felt a lot of guilt, you know. Why did you feel guilty, Kathy? You know, initially when that happened, I had it for 25 years, and I just thought, was it not safe to come in? Did I do something wrong? I mean, a lot of people are gone. Schmengi's was, you know, the site of one of the worst mass shootings in our country. Yet, the deaf community that was affected wants to come here to your other restaurant to heal, to be together. What does that mean to you? Uh, it means a lot to me. I enjoyed having them there. I couldn't sign with them, uh, but I could communicate with them. We had our ways. What do those blue hearts mean to you? Well, the signs all say it, you know, resilient, strong, together healing, you got to read it, remind yourself, give yourself peace if you can. You know, it's hard. You got to keep reminding myself, it's OK. You both have the wedding rings. Yes. When you look at those rings, how does that feel? What are you thinking about? When I feel anxious or I need something to help me calm my down, I touch the ring around my neck. And that, I recognize that he's still there with me. Same thing for me, too, yes. I can take that deep breath and connect with him. What do you miss the most? Oh, the most, everything. I miss everything. If you look around, the community they understand I love you. I remember at the vigil in Lewiston a few days after that happened, Kevin Bolin was a speaker at that vigil. Please with me, and I love you to those we lost. And to see that entire cathedral fill with those I love yous. And that was such a touching moment to recognize how much the community recognizes that we're in it together. Yes, and I feel like it was a quick connection between the deaf and the hearing communities, bringing us all together. It was there, we saw it, we felt it, and, and we see it. This is by far the most important work I've ever done in my life, and we're glad to be doing some small part. Why do you say that? because I'm not sure if this would be being done otherwise. And it's important for the community. And I'm glad to be doing a small part in hopefully helping the community heal. 
We've collected everything, so everything that was at the bar, the bowling alley, and anywhere around the city. Why is it important to this community and to all of you here at the museum to remember this tragedy? Because it is a part of Lewiston's history, not just what happened that night, but also how the community came together. And this is a showing of that. And Lewiston's gonna need to be on this road to recovery and moving forward. And these items are a part of that. Waterfall, right? You and Dad dove into the water, and it was very cold. When you see your children, do you see Josh? I do. I see Josh in all four of my children in different ways. How do they feel, Dad, now? Oh, they still feel very connected with their father. It may seem odd for others, but we, I have a spiritual belief. You know, I have a light in the basement that still flickers, and one day I went down there, and it adjusted just at the right time, and so I, you know, I talked to Josh, and I said, you're watching us, and, you know, the light came on, just as I had said that. How would you describe Dad? It's always... A loving person always put his family first. Where's dad now? He's in my heart. <sighs> and he's watching over us. And also, he's downstairs. We see him in the light. You can feel his love here, right now. Always. Perhaps some semblance of comfort still feeling his presence. Our thanks to Kira for that. So much more to get to tonight. Actor Jeremy Renner has returned to the hospital to thank those he says saved his life. But next, it's the biggest matchup in college sports. The college football playoff final is set after a wild weekend of games. We take a look by the numbers. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. We have really good news. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions. Their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Reporting from the Capitol, I'm Rachel Scott. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. After a wild bowl season and college football playoff, the national championship is set, and somehow a Pop-Tart has stolen the show. Let's take a look at it all by the numbers. In all, there were 41 bowl games and lots of late drama. Only two teams, Michigan and Washington, now remain in an overtime thriller. Last night, Michigan topped Alabama 27 to 20 in the Rose Bowl to make the college football finals. Not to be outdone, Washington outlasted Texas 37 to 31 in the Sugar Bowl. The two teams will square off Monday in the College Football National Championship in Houston, Texas. With so many bowl games named after foods, there was only one with a Pop-Tart mascot. You see him there, Strawberry. The Pop-Tart Bowl ended with a 28 to 19 win by Kansas State, and it didn't necessarily make headlines on the field, but off the field when Strawberry entered a life-size toaster and emerged only to literally be eaten after the game. A marketing group estimates so far Pop-Tarts has earned at least $12 million worth of exposure from the event, and we would be remiss if we did not mention the coach the one coach that was subjected to a mayonnaise bath after his team in the West Virginia Mountaineers won Duke's Mayo Bowl. Our congratulations to all the winning teams over the past few days and perhaps our condolences for that one coach who got the Mayo bath. And we still have much more here on Prime. A wild scene involving a fight between a motorcycle group and a former Beverly Hills 90210 cast member what started the chaos. And a woman is celebrating the birth of two daughters why doctors are calling it a one in a million pregnancy. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. The magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now wherever you stream your news.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. An actor's violent altercation on the streets of L.A., the major infant formula recall over potential bacteria contamination, and we have a winner, folks, where the Powerball jackpot ticket was sold. These stories are much more in tonight's rundown. <laughs> Actor Ian Ziering from Sharknado and Beverly Hills 90210, furious after being attacked by bikers in LA on New Year's Eve. Ziering now saying on Instagram, I am relieved to report that my daughter and I are both completely unscathed, but the incident has left me deeply concerned about the growing boldness of such groups. This situation highlights a larger issue of hooliganism on our streets and the need for effective law enforcement responses. They have revealed the first photos from the Alec Baldwin Western film Rust. That film put on hold after a bullet from a prop gun killed the director of photography. Two of the five photos published exclusively by Deadline show the work of the late DP Helena Hutchins, who died when Alec Baldwin held that prop gun that fired during rehearsals in October of 2021. The other photos show the work of Bianca Klein, who took over as the photography director when the production resumed last April. Producer Producers have yet to announce when they'll release the film. A new state law in Arkansas will give new mothers the option to be screened for depression. The law requires health care providers to offer to screen mothers for depression within six weeks of giving birth and for insurance policies to cover the screening. The exception would be if the mother declines to be screened, in which case health care providers would note that she was not screened by her choice. State Representative Aaron Plinkington, who sponsored the legislation, told affiliate KATV that screening new mothers would help health care providers catch issues early on. Obviously, if they're not in a good place mentally, uh, their physical health can also start deteriorating. And also, too, it's not good to be in a home for a newborn baby if, if mom's having some issues that she needs to get addressed. Police in Indiana are crediting a good Samaritan for helping with a rescue after a car accident. WLS reports the early Monday morning crash in Gary presented a challenge for police who had trouble finding the flipped over car in the dark after the two women inside called 911. One of the women was able to get out of the car and flag down Greg Zellers, who was on his way to work. He then helped first responders find the car. Came back up here to give the 
the dispatch better direction on where exactly the car was at, and they wanted me to wait there with them till the police arrived on the scene. WLS reports that one woman in the car was airlifted to the hospital, and the one who flagged down Zellers did not have serious injuries. Wreck It Me Johnson Nutrition is voluntarily recalling more than 675,000 cans of Nutramogen Hypoallergenic Infant Formula Pattern. This is a specialty formula that's given to infants who are allergic to cow's milk. The bacterial contamination was found in samples overseas, and the company says testing did not turn up any problems here in the U.S., but it decided to issue the recall out of a, quote, abundance of caution. Now, the company says the recall will not impact any of its other products, and and there haven't been any reports of illnesses. Someone in Michigan had a great start to 2024. A winning $842.4 million Powerball ticket was sold in Grand Blanc, Michigan, with a cash value of $425.2 million. It was the 35th drawing since the last winning ticket back in October. No winner has come forward yet, but the store owner where the ticket was sold told WJRT he hopes it's someone local. Everybody's like friends here, you know, friends and family, so I'm hoping it's one of them. Singer Paul Abdul accuses American Idol producer Nigel Lithgow of sexual assault in a recently filed lawsuit. Abdul alleges the assault took place during her time as a judge on the reality competition show back in the early 2000s. The lawsuit also accuses Lithgow of sexually assaulting Abdul after she left American Idol and became a judge on Lithgow's other competition show, So You Think You Can Dance. Lithgow has denied the allegations, saying that he will, quote, fight this appalling smear with everything I have. And we turn now to the latest on actor Jeremy Renner's recovery and a special moment over the weekend when he visited the very hospital that he credits with saving his life about a year ago after that devastating snowplow accident. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has his story. Jeremy Renner making a surprise return. The Avengers star going back to the hospital in Reno, Nevada, thanking the staff that helped save his life. Someone's in front of my house on the ground. They got run over by a snow cat. He's been crushed. The 52-year-old run over by a large snowplow on New Year's Day in 2023. First responders capturing the moment on body camera. The actor's nephew telling authorities that Renner got out of the plow to check on him, but the plow didn't stop. He tried to jump on it and it, and it took him under. And it took him under. The Marvel star suffering 30 broken bones and blunt force trauma to his chest. A long journey to recovery, Renner has continued to document online. So I shift the narrative of it being victimized or making a mistake or anything else. I refuse to be haunted by that memory that way. Renner telling Diane Sawyer there were moments he thought he wouldn't make it. When we just endured, that's real love. It's suffering, but that feeds the seeds of what love is. Now, the 52-year-old commemorating the anniversary of the accident with his new single titled, Wait. If you wait, wait. Dedicated to his daughter, whom he credits as his number one reason for recovery. Kiss you goodnight forever. Posting this picture of the two of them on Instagram, writing, I asked her to wait for me when I first saw her January 14th as I arrived home. As I got better, she got better, less afraid. There is simply no better motivator to recover than to heal your family and friends. And next, we want to introduce you to a remarkable 12-year-old who is making history as the first athlete wearing a hijab to win a gold medal at this world, at the world's largest jiu-jitsu tournament for kids after the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation lifted its ban on the headdress back in 2014. Here's her story. I made history as the first female to ever wear hijab for the Kids Pan's Brazilian tournament. The biggest tournament for kids. It's important to see that like other girls like me, like wearing the hijab during Jiu Jitsu. In 2011, there was a ban. You weren't allowed to wear hijab while competing. Without that ban being lifted in 2014, I wouldn't have been making history. I would not have been the champion. My hijab is so special to me because it shows a sign in my like fate in my religion. Start like this. Good. Hold on. 
I come from a household full of jiu-jitsu, and my dad's my coach. When we get in this position, deep down. I'm gonna start Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in 2017, and her progression during that time has been very, very consistent. I wanted my daughter to start training jiu-jitsu and martial arts because I wanted her to have confidence. Because you could just look at the scar, and sometimes a look could trigger but jiu-jitsu has given her the confidence to basically speak up and kind of uh, not be afraid of who she is, where she comes from. Whether my dad's on the mat, he's coaching me, and he's always looking for like the best in me. And of course, I'm a daddy's girl, and he just makes jiu-jitsu more fun for you. I train on weekdays of school days. I train mostly four times a week and then Sundays. And when we're here, we're doing submissions or mount, we're doing side control. The feeling when I had when I won the Kids Pans Brazilian tournament was excitement. I almost started crying. <laughs> I was super happy, so proud of myself, and I just felt like I did it, like I was there. As a dad, I'm very, very proud. Uh, as a coach, I'm even more prouder. I want everyone to know Jiu-Jitsu is not a boy sport. It's a girl sport, too. Anything a boy can do, a girl can do. And she is doing it well. And it's a one in a million pregnancy. An Alabama mom with a rare double uterus was pregnant with a baby in each uterus. She gave birth to healthy twin girls over the holidays. ABC's Morgan Norwood has her story. Kelsey Hatcher, the Alabama mom with the rare double uterus, who is pregnant with a fetus in each, introducing us to her healthy twin girls, Roxy and Rebel. So we actually delivered Roxy, our first little girl, in the OR. She was born at 749. Everybody cheered and it was like, oh my gosh, we did it. And then the reality of like, okay, we have to prepare for the next one. But Rebel, well, let's just say she lived up to her name. She was not quite ready yet. So it took about 10 hours in between the two, but at that point, six o'clock-ish the next morning, we decided it was time for a C-section. Roxy and Rebel born from two separate uteri, 10 hours apart, and on two different days. Hands, guys, they'd be born on separate days, right? Yeah, there even was a chance that we talked about that they could possibly be weeks apart. It really is fitting for the course for the way that things are. They each had their own home while growing, and so now they'll have their own birthday. The Hatchers thanking the staff at UAB as they savor the snuggles with their miracle babies. The twins' older siblings, also smitten. Overall, that they have adjusted really well. They are very loving. And as for whether the girls will have that classic twin bond we hear so much about, well, Dad says they're off to a good start. They like to cry together. But I'm curious to see as they grow if they'll still keep that little bond. Such a special and unique bond. Our thanks to Morgan for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. In the next hour, a Spanish soccer star testifies over a controversial kiss she said a football federation chief planted on her lips without her consent. What's next in the investigation? Plus, a deadly shark attack at a busy tourist destination. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. I gotta have it in the night. 
three. What you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us afternoons for everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. I was terrified. It was just so traumatic. Nightmare. <laughs> People need to understand, these were wanted babies. 18 women facing life and death medical conditions, their lives now out of their control. I felt like I was going to die. Our lives and our health are debatable. I wouldn't wish this upon my worst enemy. Diane Sawyer, Rachel Scott, On the Brink, now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We have a lot of news to get to this evening, including the urgent investigation underway after an airline jet caught fire after colliding with a Coast Guard plane that was killed and injured in Tokyo as the country deals with a rising death toll after a massive earthquake hit the race against the clock to save those trapped. Plus, the deadly car blast in Rochester being investigated as an intentional act and the migrant crisis in the U.S. now hitting the suburbs outside major cities after New York City's mayor said you must give us 32 hours notice. Buses carrying hundreds of asylum seekers now dropping off migrants in the suburbs. But we do begin in Japan, where that country is dealing with the aftermath of twin tragedies. A 7.6 magnitude earthquake and a wild passenger plane crash. The crash, though, is being called a miracle tonight after all 379 passengers and crew made it off after their Japan Airlines flight slammed into a Coast Guard aircraft. The shocking scene played out at Tokyo's Haneda International Airport, one of the busiest in the world. Passengers raced down the emergency slide. Every one of them got away before the plane was completely engulfed in flames. But sadly, at least five people on board the Coast Guard plane passed away. That plane was full of supplies bound for the part of Western Japan, devastated by an earthquake roughly 24 hours earlier. The death toll from the quake is at least 55 people as aftershocks continue to rattle the region. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, leads us off tonight from Tokyo. Tonight, the urgent investigation into how this Japan Airlines flight landing at one of the busiest airports in the world collided with a Japanese Coast Guard plane readying for takeoff. Video showing the moment of impact, Flight 516 loaded with 379 passengers and crew engulfed in flames blazing down the runway. The plane sliding to a stop on its nose and belly. Inside, smoke fills the cabin, emergency slides deployed, and dozens of firefighters dousing the wreckage with fire retardant. Landing. Landing. Landing after but, fire. And then, but they went on the slides. Yes. The emergency oh, exit. No, no, yes, yes, yes. We spoke to Yamake, who was on that flight, and says this video was shot from his seat, fire shooting from the engine. Then what he saw on the outside. The plane on its belly, foam raining down as fire incinerated the wing. Miraculously, everyone on board was evacuated within seconds. Authorities saying 17 people suffered injuries. 
Tonight, the runway is closed and only the charred hull remains. Experts crediting the carbon fiber fuselage and passengers heeding the commands of cabin crew with all those lives saved. Almost always, these incursions and these near misses are the result of human error. Whether it was human error in the control tower, on the ground, in one of the cockpits, that's something that the Japanese will need to determine. French crash investigators joined by five investigators from Airbus will travel to Japan. This is what they'll be focusing on. Japan and five and six continue with sleep right. Communication with air traffic control. Japanese authorities saying five members of that Coast Guard plane sitting on the runway were killed. This was part of the twin tragedies that struck Japan within 24 hours. That Coast Guard flight headed to western Japan to deliver aid after a massive 7.6 earthquake shook the country hours into the new year. The quake sparking fires and liquefying the ground, triggering mudslides. The death toll there rising. At least 55 people have died as rescuers raced to find trapped residents under collapsed buildings. And more tremors today as new footage shows the widespread destruction, roads split in two, homes buried under the mud. This could have been one of the deadliest aviation disasters in history. Matt Gutman joins us now from the Haneda Airport in Tokyo. And Matt, we can see all those stranded passengers behind you. Uh, what are those passengers who made it off of that plane unscathed telling you tonight? Incredibly, they're saying that it was calm, that all the passengers on the plane heeded the advice of the crew to stay calm, to exit in an orderly fashion, and above all, to leave their personal effects behind. And as you mentioned, this could have been far deadlier. One of the things that is becoming clear in the probe so far is that had that uh, Coast Guard cargo plane nosed even a few feet farther onto the runway as Flight 516 came in, it might have not hit the wing or the engine of the plane as it did, but the fuselage, and that could have caused a catastrophic explosion that could have killed perhaps all of the people on board that flight, Lindsay. And just remarkable to hear them say there was so much calm there. Uh, Matt Gutman for us in Tokyo tonight. Thanks so much, Matt. Back here in the U.S., investigators in Rochester, New York, say they believe a deadly car crash just after midnight on New Year's Day appeared to be intentional but not terrorism. A large SUV collided with an Uber pulling out of a parking lot as a concert was getting out. Both vehicles then struck pedestrians crossing the street. ABC senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky has the details. Tonight, police here in Rochester believe this fiery crash less than an hour into 2024 was no accident. They identified this man, 35-year-old Michael Avery, as the driver of a large SUV filled with gas cans that barreled into a crowd of people leaving a concert. And they said he did it on purpose. Avery sped up, crossed into the oncoming lane of traffic, and appears to have intentionally been driving towards the pedestrian crossing. Nine pedestrians were hurt, but many more could have been had the SUV not collided with a smaller rideshare vehicle pulling out of the parking lot, killing two passengers. Identified tonight as 29-year-old Joshua Orr and 28-year-old Justina Hughes. You believe he sped up or sped toward the he crosswalk did. and the pedestrians? Yes, you can clearly see that. It was intentional. And it was days in the making. Police said Avery came to Rochester from Syracuse, checking into a hotel December 27th. Police have now searched his room. Two days later, he left his car at the airport and rented the large SUV. The day after that, he went around buying gas cans and filling them up. At least a dozen were found in and around the charred wreckage. The smell of gasoline was just so intense. I, I couldn't believe how strong it was. So far, authorities have found no evidence of any ties to foreign or domestic terrorism and no social or political bias. The suspect died of his injuries. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. Authorities are investigating an alarming break-in at the Colorado Supreme Court in Denver. Investigators say a suspect shot his way into the building overnight. No justices were there at the time, but they have been on edge and under threat after a ruling last month barred former President Trump from the state's primary ballot. ABC's Mola Lange is in Denver. Tonight, an armed man breaking into the Colorado Supreme Court building in Denver, where justices are already on high alert after ruling Donald Trump off the state's primary ballot two weeks ago. Police saying 44-year-old Brandon Olson was first involved in a car crash right outside the court building just after 1 a.m. There was a car accident. One of the vehicles involved already pulled a gun out. Police adding that Olson pointed that gun at the other driver, then broke into the building by shooting out a window. Authorities saying he then held an unarmed guard at gunpoint, took his keys, and made his way to the seventh floor, where he fired from the building. Officials say no one was struck. 
a tense standoff dragging on for two hours until about 3 a.m., Olson calling 911 and surrendering. Colorado court justices receiving threats after ruling President Trump ineligible for the state's primary, citing the Constitution's 14th Amendment in saying his actions on January 6th amounted to insurrection. But officials today say they've confirmed with a high probability this incident is not associated to the recent threats. Our thanks to Mola. And it's that 14th Amendment case against the former president that's at the center of the political world's attention. With all eyes on the Trump team, they're expected to peel of that case all the way to the Supreme Court. The ripple effects of the case could be huge and impact almost every presidential campaign moving forward. Can a former president be ousted from the ballot? And what about the pending case in Maine? Our Rachel Scott has all that as we mark just 13 days until the Iowa caucuses. Tonight, former President Donald Trump is fighting to get on every primary ballot, appealing the decision by Maine Secretary of State as biased, saying she had no legal authority to bar him from running. In two unprecedented decisions, Maine and Colorado had taken the former president off the ballot, citing the 14th Amendment, which blocks anyone who swore an oath to the Constitution and engaged in an insurrection or rebellion from holding office. But Trump's lawyers tonight arguing the insurrection clause bars people from holding specified offices, not from running for them or being elected to them, insisting the secretary wrongfully denied President Trump a place on the Republican primary ballot. With just 13 days until the first contest, Trump still holds a commanding lead in Iowa, more than 30 points ahead of his rivals. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis is going all in on Iowa, visiting all 99 counties. Are you ready to work hard over these next two weeks so that we win the Iowa caucus? But he's losing ground to Nikki Haley, who is gaining momentum. Only Trump, DeSantis and Haley have qualified for the next debate. And tonight, Haley challenging Trump to show up with her and DeSantis, saying, as the debate stage continues to shrink, it's getting harder for Donald Trump to hide. Our thanks to Rachel Scott for that. Claudine Gay, Harvard's first black president, resigned today. Her tenure is now the shortest in the history of the institution. ABC's senior White House correspondent Selena Wang has that story. Tonight, Harvard's embattled president Claudine Gay resigning, facing accusations of plagiarism and weeks of criticism for her congressional testimony on anti-Semitism and hate on campus. In a statement, Gay saying she resigned, quote, so that our community can navigate this moment of extraordinary challenge with a focus on the institution rather than any individual. Gay was one of the three top university presidents who came under fire over their statements to members of Congress who said those leaders were not doing enough to combat anti-Semitism. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. What's the context? Targeted as, at an individual. It's targeted at Jewish students, Jewish individuals. Do you understand your testimony is dehumanizing them? Afterwards, Gay apologized for what she called poor wording in her testimony. Gay under pressure to step down from House members, donors, and prominent alumni. And more recently, she faced allegations of plagiarism for material contained in her academic writings. Harvard had previously ordered an investigation that revealed, quote, a few instances of inadequate citation, but the university finding no violation of its standards for research misconduct. Our thanks to Selena for that. Now to Beirut, Lebanon, where an explosion has killed six people, including the second highest ranking leader of Hamas. Two U.S. officials say Israel was responsible for the strike. The attack risks spreading the war and bringing the well-armed Hezbollah militia into the fight. ABC's Marcus Moore is in Israel tonight. Tonight, a massive explosion rocking the Lebanese capital, Beirut, killing a top Hamas official. Video circulating online showing the fiery scene of the blast in the Beirut suburb of Dahia, a Hezbollah stronghold. Salak al aruri the second in command of Hamas and a senior leader in the West Bank, among at least six people killed, according to Lebanese authorities. <laughs> Lebanon's state-run news agency says Israel carried out the attack, which, if confirmed, would mark a major escalation and would be Israel's first attack on Beirut since 2006. Israel tonight declining to comment. But Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had threatened to kill Aruri before the Israel-Hamas war erupted on October 7th. Today's blast in Beirut follows weeks of cross-border attacks in southern Lebanon and northern Israel between Hezbollah fighters and IDF soldiers. 
Marcus Moore reporting. Mounting pressure on some of America's cities continues as migrants are arriving and no resolve appears to be in sight. Last month alone, CBP agents encountered more than 302,000 migrants, an all-time high. ABC Stephanie Ramos has more tonight as fear the migrant crisis could be entering a new phase, the U.S. suburbs. Tonight, the influx of migrants to major cities far from the border is spreading to their suburbs. After New York's mayor, Eric Adams, issued an order requiring buses carrying migrants from border cities to New York to give the city a minimum of 32 hours notice. Hundreds of migrants were instead bused to commuter train stations in New Jersey, where they rode trains into New York, effectively circumventing the order. A similar situation in the suburbs of Chicago. Some 350 migrants flown to Rockford Airport over the weekend, then bussed in. Tonight, Mayor Adams is blaming Texas Governor Greg Abbott and asking more cities to issue executive orders. It's not about just New York. No city should be going through this, and it's not sustainable. Sources tell ABC News there were 302,000 migrant encounters in December alone. The preliminary numbers far surpassing the previous record of nearly 270,000 in September. Oh. Abbott and other border governors have said until the situation is brought under control and properly addressed, they will continue to send migrants to these so-called sanctuary cities. Our thanks to Stephanie. Now to a deadly shark attack in Hawaii. A surfer was killed at a popular beach there. Here's ABC's DeMarco Morgan with the details. It is a uh, living nightmare. A family grieving after a shark encounter in a popular tourist destination in Maui ended in tragedy. Authorities investigating the death of 39-year-old Jason J. Carter, seen here scuba diving prior to the incident, after getting bit by a shark while surfing at Paia Bay on Saturday. Whether you had a lifetime with him or five minutes, you felt like a changed person because of his beautiful spirit. Carter, a local Maui resident, was given medical care at the scene before being rushed to an area hospital, where he later succumbed to his injuries. He wasn't doing anything reckless or strange or out of the norm. This, the first fatality from a shark encounter in Hawaii in more than a year. Experts say shark encounters aren't limited to just the summer months. Really disconcerting there. Thanks to DeMarco for that. And still much more to get to tonight coming up. She's trying to expand wealth to those previously left out of the loop. Arlen Hamilton explains her guide to becoming a millionaire. But next, a South Korean opposition leader is stabbed in the neck. What investigators are revealing about the suspect? Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? 
<laughs> yeah. So oh what God. will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? So what would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. I'm Whit Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Russia launched an attack on Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities earlier today, continuing its escalated large-scale attacks on residential areas. The attacks, which also hit Kharkiv, lasted about four hours, with Russia launching about a dozen ballistic missiles and roughly 35 Iranian-made drones. According to President Zelensky, at least five people were killed and more than 100 injured. South Korea's opposition Democratic Party leader Lee Jae-myung was stabbed in the neck during a visit to the southern city of Busan and was airlifted to University Hospital for treatment. The attacker appeared to be a man in his 50s or 60s who wore a paper crown with Lee's name on it. That's according to news photographs. The assailant was quickly subdued by men that included police officers. According to local media, he was refusing to answer police questions about his motives. Spanish soccer star Jenny Hermoso testified at the Madrid High Court over the kiss. She said Football Federation Chief Luis Rubiales planted on her lips without her consent after Spain's victory in the Women's World Cup last summer. Hermoso spent about two and a half hours speaking behind closed doors to the investigating judge who was examining evidence, including television footage, before deciding whether to approve charges and advance the case to trial. Rubiales has said the kiss was, quote, spontaneous, mutual, euphoric, and consensual. With the new year in full swing, many of us are hoping to step it up a bit in 2024. And serial entrepreneur, author, and podcast host Arlen Hamilton wants to get you to your first million dollars, downloads, customers, or otherwise. As one of the few black women to break into the Boys Club of Silicon Valley, she offers her secrets on how anyone can build a legacy of wealth and impact in her book, Your First Million, Why You Don't Have to Be Born into a Legacy of Wealth to Leave One Behind. And Arlen, kind enough to join us in studio studio. Welcome and happy launch day. Thank you so much. So you have such an inspiring story as we were talking about. We've met uh, a few years ago and I remember you talking about struggles with poverty, with homelessness at, at one point. Now you're a venture capitalist, super successful many times over. Why did you decide that you wanted to pay it forward and, and show other people you can do this too? Thanks for having me here. Um, I wanted to write the book that I wish was written when mm -hmm. I was starting out. And um, I'm continuously learning, and I'm in rooms that a lot of people are not in mm -hmm. and from a perspective that is unique. And so every time I'm in those rooms, I'm taking notes to bring back to other people. You have a podcast of the same name, Your First Million. How will people get different advice, or, or how does it differ from the advice that they're going to see written down in the pages of your book from mm -hmm. what they can tune in and listen to on the yeah. podcast? I think both are great and accessible. I'm usually interviewing other people mm -hmm. on the podcast, so I'm getting their perspectives just so we can have representation of you can start from anywhere. And the book, I wanted it to be a guidebook. I wanted to... Uh, inspire, but also uh, teach you some t um, tactical things and some takeaways. So in each section, there are actionable takeaways that you can start implementing today. You talk often about changing the demographics of the world's decision makers. Elaborate on that thought for us. Yeah, I just think that uh, if the world and the country were more representative in the places of power of the demographics, then there would be a lot of uh, different outcomes. Um, the power and control and um, just a higher quality of life, I think, for more people. And you literally put your money where your mouth is. Talk to us about Backstage Capital, what you do, yeah. and how that really focuses in a different way. Sure. I started Backstage Capital t about 10 years ago when very few people were talking about race and gender and orientation in Silicon Valley. And uh, less than 10% of venture funding goes to women, people of color, and LGBTQ founders. Mm. So we invest in that demographic, those demographics. Less than 10%. Less than 10% where a white man makes up about 30, or white men make about 30% of the country. So they're getting, uh, it's, out, it's outsized. What kinds of tips would you give for people who have that entrepreneurial bug, but they're just afraid and they and they don't know how yeah. or where to start? Yeah. Well, read my book. That's a great place <laughs> to start, seriously, because I, I have a different perspective and I, I've been there. 
I, I understand that perspective. Um, also, it really first is about a mindset shift. And I think that what really helped me unlock a lot of things was to understand that we really don't have a lot of time to worry about imposter syndrome or if we're supposed to be in the room because we have a lot of time to make up for as underrepresented, underestimated people. For people who haven't gotten a chance to get the book just yet, just came yeah. out today, uh, one little tip, one little secret nugget. Yeah, I would say to st start writing down, maybe um, do a, a staycation or something and write down what is your passion, what fulfills you, and what's something that you think you could do for a few years that would uh, sustain you, and then write down why you would be doing it. Who are you doing this for? yourself and others. And I think that's the, the thing that'll help you find your calling rather than just your dream. You are, are such an inspiration, as I said, and, and so countless people, uh, no doubt, will be able to get some, some good tips and, and, and your two cents in this book and a lot more. Yes. <laughs> Arlen, thank you so much. We want to let our viewers know your first million, why you don't have to be born into a legacy of wealth to leave one behind, can be found wherever books are sold. And still to come, four sisters, four babies, and a holiday celebration to end an incredible year. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. Finally tonight, trips to Grandma's house will never be the same. One family celebrated a holiday dream times four. For one family in Omaha, Nebraska, the four in 2024 is especially significant. This is Miles Thomas. This is Carson Taylor. This is Stanley Leland. This is Lydia Jones. There are four theme sisters, and there's a common theme this year. All four sisters gave birth in 2023, all gathering now together with their new bundles of joy. Christmas Day is just our immediate family, and we open up all the presents, and we actually had all matching Grinch pajamas, even the, the dads, all of them. The four cousins met for the first time on Thanksgiving when they were each baptized. It's such a unique experience to become a mom, but then to watch your sisters become moms all at the same time and just have your your love expand that much more to have all of these nieces and nephews. The shared experience of being pregnant and bringing babies into the world the same year has brought these sisters even closer together. To just be on this journey with my sisters from the breastfeeding to the labor and delivery, each stage has been so awesome and just continues to bring us closer. Hi. The cousins enjoying some floor time together this afternoon. And tonight, this message from their grateful mothers. From our growing family to yours, we wish you all a safe, happy, and healthy new year. Oh, baby. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and, of course, abcnews.com. The news never stops. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.